grab your Bibles or devices with Bible apps and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And if you don't have a Bible of your own, you can take one of the hardcover blue Bibles and turn to page 988. Before we get into an Advent series that we're going to start next week in preparation for Christmas, I wanted to seize this opportunity to show you how, from God's Word, we find that the practice of thanksgiving, of expressing gratitude, is actually a key part of God's will for our lives. Not just once a year, but every day, because I know, like all of us, um, it's easy to kind of celebrate thanksgiving almost like this stepping stone to Christmas. And oftentimes we, we do that because, without realizing it, us as a culture, we kind of want to get to that point. Okay, we want to say thank you as quickly and painlessly as possible and get to getting me stuff. Get to the lights, get to the shows, get to the tinsel, and so on. But what we find and what the holiday of Thanksgiving is meant to, in some ways, lead us to is what we find here in this passage, and that's that Thanksgiving is actually a key part of God's will for our lives, for our good. Because God, as as the creator and the the all-wise, all-powerful ruler of the universe has a perfect understanding of what it takes for his creation, us as human beings, to thrive. And he has graciously and generously provided us with this sort of user's manual, if you will, in the Bible, in his word, to instruct us on how we can thrive, what it means for us to live in the way that is truly best. And even when we come to know how God has called us to live for his glory, like for some of you, this passage we look at today may be nothing new, but we need to be reminded because we are prone to forget or become distracted because there's all these other things going on, all these other voices, all these other trends, and they tend to pull us away, even when we get it at first. And so our passage today presents us with something that is essential if we are to thrive as God intends for us to thrive, both individually and collectively as a church. And it's something that applies to everyone here, regardless of your age, your stage in life, your circumstances, even whether or not you believe in God this morning or have trusted and followed Jesus Christ. This applies to you and is something good for you to pay attention to. Now, because we're kind of you know paratrooping into this book without doing sort of a study through it, let me just give a little bit of context because it's always important for us to understand the meaning and significance of a passage to consider its context and not just pull it out and see, I think it means this, right? So the book of 1 Thessalonians was originally a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit, as all scripture was, written by the Apostle Paul on behalf of a group of fellow missionaries that included Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. If you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see that. And he wrote this letter to the first century church of Thessalonica, which is a real place. Okay, you can look it up if you Google it. It's the modern day Greek city of Thessaloniki. Now the church in Thessalonica began when Paul and Silas, who were two missionaries, went on this missionary journey together around 50 AD. And Thessalonica was and is a, a large port city on the Aegean Sea. And so it was a center for trade at that time. And because of that, there was lots of wealth and it was a center for Roman culture too. And this resulted in the city being full of Greek and Roman expressions of pagan worship. And so when Paul and Silas got there and and began preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, as you can actually read about in Acts 17, although many trusted in Jesus in response to to the gospel, there was this immediate opposition to Christianity, intense persecution. And that's why Paul describes in chapter 1, verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians, that the word, aka the gospel of Jesus Christ, was received by the Thessalonian Christians in much affliction. And in chapter 2, verse 2, it says, they declared the gospel to them in the midst of much conflict. So, For the Thessalonian Christians in the first century A.D., to trust and follow Jesus came at a great cost. They could lose their jobs, their possessions, their freedoms, or even their lives by saying that they believed in Jesus. Because to do so meant that they would be viewed by 
those around them, their countrymen, as traitors of Rome because they were saying that Jesus was Lord instead of Caesar. And they refused to worship the traditional gods of the Roman Empire. But despite the challenges they faced, the church of Thessalonica was kind of like the poster child of the early church at that time. You know, Paul references in chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, saying, They became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Because God worked through the church of Thessalonica to spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout their region and throughout the Roman Empire. They were making a huge difference in the world at that time. God used them to bring many more people to faith and to inspire other churches to be faithful. And therefore, Paul wrote to encourage this church. He wanted them to keep going, keep up the good work, despite the challenges. Because as we can probably all attest to in some ways, even when you're doing something right, over time, if you don't have that ongoing encouragement, it's easy to lose heart. It's easy to slowly let go and give up, even when you're doing the right thing. And so, that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to strengthen them in their faith. He wanted to inspire them to continue living their lives as Christians in a way that was best for their souls and also glorifying to God, meaning that it would reveal the greatness of God to the world around them. And quite frankly, I I was led to this passage because that's what I want for us. Now, throughout the letter, there are all kinds of, of words of encouragement and instruction that Paul gives as inspired by the Holy Spirit. And our passage today is just one example of that. This this book, 1 Thessalonians, is so chock full of very practical, helpful truths. But what we find in this passage is that this church, while it endured great trials and aspired to live in faithfulness to Jesus, was called to three things. And so look at chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 with me. It simply says this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the word of the Lord. Now, oftentimes we may think or or wrestle with the question, what is God's will for my life? It tends to be and still is one of the most popular and common questions that Christians or sort of people who are considering and curious about Christianity ask and struggle with. But oftentimes we we wrestle with that question because we want to know the answer within our five-year plan. Like what's God's will for my future is usually what we mean behind that. What career should I pursue? Who should I date or marry? Where should I live? And so on. But this passage provides a helpful reminder that God's will isn't just something for our futures. God's will, in fact, is revealed throughout the Bible to impact our lives in the present, right now. God's will is for the right here and the right now. And God's will for the Thessalonian church in the first century and our church in the 21st century has three parts in this passage. First of all, rejoice always. Biblical commentator Leon Morris explains in some older English, just a little bit of Heads up. The injunction to rejoice evermore is at first sight a little surprising, coming from one who had to suffer as much and as continually as had Paul. But he had learned that affliction and deep joy may go together and could rejoice in tribulations. So he can counsel perpetual rejoicing even to a church which was suffering so greatly. We need to understand that that this call to rejoice always is not just your positive and encouraging K-love kind of attitude. It's more than just fake it till you make it, put on a smile and show up to church on Sunday and say, everything's great. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. There's something substantial behind that. There's something real. Because we are being called in this passage and, and throughout Scripture we are told that Christian joy is not rooted in our circumstances. Christian joy is rooted in the promise of Jesus himself. For example, in John 16, 22, he's telling his disciples that he's about to go away and die, but he says that he was going to see them again, meaning he was going to be resurrected and appear to them again. And when he did, 
He said that their hearts would rejoice. And he finishes off that statement by saying, no one will take your joy from you. Christian joy is also rooted in the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, in the human heart of every Christian. That's why Galatians 5.22 points out, as I know several weeks ago, Brian Rathbun, one of our guest preachers, led us to consider this. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. That's what the Holy Spirit does in every single believer, is produce joy. And therefore, Christian joy is rooted in Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, not our circumstances. That's why it's possible for a Christian to go through painful, sad situations and yet still have joy. As Paul describes himself and his fellow Christians in 2 Corinthians 6.10, he, he says that we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So the first thing we need to understand is that God's will for our lives is to experience and express joy in a way that is not determined. It's not riding the emotional roller coaster of our circumstances. But something that is rooted in the reality of who Jesus is, what He has done for us, and the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And I think this is really important for us, because whether you're going through something now, or, we, or you will inevitably in the future, we, we naturally adopt the philosophy of our culture when it comes to joy. And we think that our satisfaction in life our happiness is entirely dependent on everyone else around us. We are victims of circumstance. And so if things aren't going my way, then I guess I just have to be miserable. I can't be satisfied because things are just going in a direction that isn't, doesn't feel good for me. And so as we, we struggle with disappointment, discontentment, anxiety, depression, and all these sorts of things, the world tells us you can't have joy. And it's easy to believe that. Which is why we need reminders like this. That no matter what's going on, no matter how we are feeling in the moment because of our circumstances, internally or externally, joy is still possible. It's possible for us to have a deep sense of contentment, satisfaction. That is joy. Now, the second thing that God calls us to in this passage is prayer without ceasing. Now, Charles Spurgeon helps us understand the, the connection between these first two commands. They're not, they're not just these separate random things, but they're intertwined. They're meant to be. He writes, the more we pray, the more we rejoice. Prayer gives a channel to the pent-up sorrows of the soul. They flow away. And in their place, streams of sacred delight pour into the heart. At the same time, the more rejoicing, the more praying. Because when the heart is in a quiet condition and full of joy in the Lord, then also will it be sure to draw near to the Lord in worship. Holy joy and prayer act and react on each other. So I know that's a lot, and, and Charles Spurgeon loves to say things in a very fancy way. So if I can attempt to try and say that a little bit more plainly, it's this. Prayer to God leads us to find joy in Him. And joy in God moves us to worship Him in prayer. Sometimes the human heart needs to express the worries and pains and, and sorrows that fill our hearts in the moment. To cast our cares on Him, as 1 Peter 5, 7 says, because He cares for us. For those of you who were here at the Thanksgiving Eve service, we saw that with David. He was going through one of the most intense trials of his life, and he just had to tell God how he was struggling at the time. But as he did that, and as we can do that, those, those angst, those fears, those hurts can in some ways be dealt with and then laid to the side. We can be emptied of them so that then we can be filled with the joy of the Lord. We saw that in David in Psalm 13, and we see that here. We can find our joy in Christ instead when we bring our troubles and cares to the Lord. But additionally, as we experience the joy of Christ by the Holy Spirit again, we will naturally seek to express our enjoyment in God. That's, that's just how we're wired as beings. When you really enjoy something, you have to express that. Sometimes that you, that's you take that bite of that, your favorite food and you just go, mmm. Sometimes you take a selfie and say, this is delicious, everybody check it out. 
Whatever it is, we, we are wired to express joy. And what better way to express joy in God than to directly communicate our joy in God to God? Say, God, you're good. You're worthy. You are worthy to be blessed. You give and take away. All these songs that we have already sung this morning are, in many ways, prayers put to music to express joy in Him. And so, you see, joy in God and prayer to God are meant to be linked in our lives. But there is something that, that needs to be clarified here, uh, lest we, we take things to, I think, a radical extreme. But the specific call, right, is to pray without ceasing. And so I want to bring in uh, biblical theologian Craig S. Keener here with some helpful insights. Even the strictest pietists, he writes, of Judaism did not pray all day, but they prayed regularly, much and faithfully. Praying without ceasing could mean this type of prayer or to carry the attitude of prayer with oneself throughout the day, not just in corporate worship or personal quiet times. And Leon Morris helps explain that further when he says, quote, It is not possible for us to spend all our time with words of prayer on our lips, but it is possible for us to be all our days in the spirit of prayer, realizing our dependence on God for all that we have and are, realizing something of His presence with us wherever we may be, and yielding ourselves continually to Him for the doing of His will. Essentially, the point is not that every waking minute of our lives should be filled with verbal or internal conversations with God. Rather, we are to live in constant dependence on God, constant awareness that God is with us, and constant submission to His will in our lives. That is, in essence, the spirit of prayer. But if that is our attitude then we will find ourselves regularly moved to pray to God with spoken words or internal thoughts throughout the day while you're driving on your way here. You know, as I'm getting a call from my wife that we have a flat tire and on my drive there, I'm like, okay, God, it's going to be one of those mornings. Help, help, help. So God wants us to live in a constant connection and relationship with Him that shapes every moment of our lives. That's what it's getting at here. Now, next we see the constant joy of Christ by the Spirit and the ceaseless spirit of prayer leads us to the third thing our passage calls for. Give thanks in all circumstances, right? In the words of Charles Spurgeon, again, he writes, quote, When joy and prayer are married, their firstborn child is gratitude. And as we find joy in God by the Holy Spirit and relate to God through prayer, that gives the perfect setup for thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is just expressing gratitude to God for the ways that He is leading us to experience joy in Him through prayer. Now again, we must consider the significance of this command to the original audience because it was written to them first before us, right? So these Thessalonian Christians were being called to give thanks in all circumstances when the majority of their circumstances on a daily basis were immensely difficult, far more so than ours today. Not what most would consider ideal conditions for thanksgiving. And yet, the thanksgiving of God's people is once again not determined by their circumstances, but it is rooted in God Himself. Again, biblical scholar Craig S. Keener comments, quote, Pagans who recognized that fate or some god was sovereign or in control over everything acknowledge that one should accept whatever comes or even give thanks for it. For Paul, those who trust God's sovereignty, that God is in control, and love them, can give thanks in every situation. So, just in case you're not aware of this, the Bible clearly reveals to us that God is all-powerful and all-loving. Both. Everything in heaven and on earth is under His authority. That's Matthew 28, 18, Jesus' own words. And He is working for the good of His people in all things. That's Romans 8, 28. And there's tons of other verses to back that up. I just wanted to give you a little taste. So when we understand and believe that, that God is in control and He is good, it's like putting on a special pair of glasses. I don't know if you've ever been through this. So, so the last time I went through something like this, I got LASIK surgery several years ago. And you kind of you go in and you're used to your own 
blurry vision of the world. And then it's like, okay, you go in, had the surgery, kept, had to keep my eyes closed, went to bed as soon as I can, woke up the next morning, and all of a sudden, boom, you see the world clearer than I'd ever seen it before. And that's kind of what it is. When we take on this perspective of, okay, God is in control and he is good, it's like gaining a new vision of life. One where we can more clearly see the, the blessings and goodness of God that are all around us. Now, Leon Morris helps us apply this further. He says, quote, It is often difficult to see the brighter side of a particular trial. But if it is our deep conviction that God is over all and that his hand is in the particular tribulation we are undergoing, then we cannot but recognize his goodness and make our act of thanksgiving. Because the fact of the matter is, even in the most difficult of trials that we may face, as we talked about this past Thursday, or no, it was Wednesday, right? Yeah, time flies when you've got three messages to prepare on a week's basis. But the number of blessings and ways that God is caring for us always immensely, infinitely outweigh the amount of trials and pains that we are going through right now. Not in a way that, that leads us to say, well, suck it up. Other people have it more difficult. No, 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 not this kind of weird pain shaming that we tend to do to ourselves. But just in an acknowledgement of reality that God's goodness far eclipses my pain. Now, as we consider these three things together, we are presented with the goodness of God towards us. I mean, think about it. It's just an open sen sentence of like, what's God's will for the lives of his creation? It could have been anything. And yet, this is it. His desire for us is for us to have constant joy in him, to have a, a ceaseless relationship with him, and for unstoppable thankfulness to, to fill our lives and pour out from us for all those who trust in Jesus Christ. I mean, joy, love and belonging, and a heart of gratitude are things that we all long for to some extent as human beings. And God is uniquely equipped and able to actually give us those things in himself. That's why I say every week, he himself is the source of everything our souls need and long for. And I mean it. Nothing else works like him. But I think it's just incredible for us to consider this. How caring and good God's will is for us. Because oftentimes, God's will for our lives gets a bad rap. Because it's like, well, God's wills, his rules, like, well, you don't have to like them, you just have to accept them. Man, that's a terrible attitude. Because every rule, if you want to call it that, everything God designs for us, even the hardest things to follow, are actually for our good, to protect us, to lead us to true thriving and flourishing. That's the will of God for us. What is truly best. But on the other side of this, we have to understand that because God has provided us with everything we need for these three commands to be fulfilled in our lives, if we fail to live according to them, this threefold call, we have no one to blame but ourselves. If we find ourselves being rather joyless in our existence, particularly for Christians, we have no excuse. As, as Jesus already promised, no one can take the joy of any Christian away from them. What we can do is let it go. We can relinquish it and exchange it for our own discontentment and desires for things in this world. But we have everything we need all the time to have a joy that is full and infinite, constant. If, if we feel a sense of disconnection from God, we have the means to do that all the time. We have constant intimacy with God, and we can do that and access that, that through prayer. And so if we feel ourselves and that we distance from God, it's really, there's no one to blame but ourselves. I mean, as we talked about last Sunday in Acts 2, we are instructed very clearly, this is how we seek and find God. The problem is that we are far too easily distracted. Now, the other sort of the third part of it, we are never at a point in our lives where there is nothing we can be thankful to God for. 
And, I, and again, I know particularly for some of us in various seasons that you're in now or have been or will be in, it's hard at times to see. I can't see the sun shining because the clouds are so dark. But the reality is there is something always there. And if we can't see it, it's not God's fault that he's not being more clear. It's our fault. We, we are nearsighted, blinded to the goodness of God in our lives. Still, when confronted with how we fall short of what this passage is leading us to, the correct response is not, okay, now try harder. Be more joyful, dadgummit. It doesn't work, okay? And for those of you who, who maybe have more legalistic leanings like me when in sort of that over-harsh kind of whip yourself into shape kind of uh, response to a lot of things, that's not how God in his perfect goodness and wisdom leads us in this. The way for us to grow in joy, to grow in, in ceaseless prayer and connection with God and, and in thanksgiving is not to just try harder, but it's to trust. It's to deepen our rest and trust in who God is and what He's done. To be reminded or perhaps educated for the first time of who He is and how He has shown us undeserved love. This passage is an expression of that. But let me just give some other examples, bring the whole counsel of Scripture to bear if I can. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have worked together to provide us with everything we need. The Father sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, reconciling us to God so that we can have ceaseless access to God in prayer. When Jesus died on the cross, and, and it tells if you've never read the story, but in the Jerusalem temple there was this really thick curtain that blocked the people from the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence dwelled. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain, super thick, like phone book thick, ripped. And what that means is that the moment that Jesus died on the cross, everyone who trusts in him has infinite, ceaseless access to God by grace. Not because you earn it, not because you clean yourself up enough to approach, but that Jesus cleanses us and Jesus gives us that access by faith in him. But also the Father and the Spirit raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So now all those who trust in Jesus Christ can find that same unbreakable joy that Jesus said his disciples would have and that no one could take that joy from them and the same is true for us. No one, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, can take your joy from you. And if somebody does or you think that somebody is or some circumstances, then one of two things is happening. One, it's not actually a joy in Jesus. Or two, whether you realize it or not, you're actually just handing somebody your joy over. They can't actually take it from you. You're saying, here. Which is, a, when you get, put it that way, and, and I know I'm, I'm convicted of, of that far too often, but it's a strange thing to think we have perfect, infinite, full satisfaction and in our broken humanity, we're just like, you know what? I'd rather be miserable today. But also, because God is sovereign, because he's in control over all things, working all things for the good of those who love and trust him, there is no shortage of things we can be thankful to him for in every circumstance. And so God's will for his glory and our good is for us to embrace what he has given us in himself. And let that lead us then to live in greater joy and prayerfulness and thanksgiving every day. That's it. That's God's will for us. And it is possible, not because we work hard enough at it, but as we learn to just rest and embrace and let the Lord lead us into those things, we find ourselves being more joyful, more prayerful, more thankful people. As I think we can all agree, regardless of what your spiritual background is at this point, we all want to be those kinds of people because we know that those are generally happier people, right? Now, I want us to kind of lead us to try and practice this. Give us an opportunity to do this. And I want to start by expressing joy and praying to the Lord. So would you join me in a word of prayer as I close this time? Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much. Thank you for your word. God, we, we thank you and praise you for being a God who uh, reigns and rules over all things and yet is so good to us that you're not just 
mindful and aware of us, but you are constantly working for the good in the way that's best. And I just pray, Lord God, desperately we need your help. We admit that. And so, God, we need you to fill us with your fullness of joy. We need you to strengthen our grip on it and not let it go. But we, we need you to, to train our minds and our hearts to just be constantly aware of our dependence on you, of your presence with us, of our access to you, so that our lives might be transformed by the reality of how you are near to us and with us every moment. And God, we need you to give us the eyes to see your blessings, your goodness. In the world around us, God, in you, yourself, and what you've done. Well, God, I pray that you give us that vision to see the wonderful ways that you're working and blessing and providing so that especially especially when our circumstances threaten to take away all attitudes of thankfulness. Let us be a people marked by thanksgiving. Not just this week because we celebrated a holiday and ate lots of food, but God, may every day be conformed to what you have said your will is in this passage. For your glory, for the good of your church, and for the sake of those who might be here or might be listening to this that don't yet know you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.